the very old folk. Thursday, November 3, 1927. Dear Melmoth, So, you are busy delving into the shady past of that insufferable young Asiatic, Varius Arvitus Bassianus. Ugh! There are few persons I loathe more than that cursed little Syrian rat. I have myself been carried back to Roman times by my recent perusal of James Rhodes' Aeneid, a translation never before read by me, and more faithful to P. Mauro than any other versified version I have ever seen, including that of my late uncle, Dr. Clark, which did not attain publication. This Virgilian diversion, together with the spectral thoughts incident to All Hallows' Eve, with its witch sabbaths on the hills, produced in me last Monday night a Roman dream of such supernal clearness and vividness, and such titanic adumbrations of hidden horror, that I verily believe I shall some day employ it in fiction. Roman dreams were no uncommon features of my youth. I used to follow the divine Julius all over Gallia as a tribunus militum o' nights, but I had so long ceased to experience them, that the present one impressed me with extraordinary force. It was a flaming sunset or late afternoon in the tiny provincial town of Pompello, at the foot of the Pyrenees in Hispania Quiterior. The year must have been in the late Republic, for the province was still ruled by a senatorial proconsul instead of a praetorian legate of Augustus, and the day was the first before the calends of November. The hills rose scarlet and gold to the north of the little town, and the westering sun shone ruddily and mystically on the crude new stone and plaster buildings of the dusty forum and the wooden walls of the circus some distance to the east. Groups of citizens, broad-browed Roman colonists and coarse-haired Romanized natives, together with obvious hybrids of the two strains, alike clad in cheap woolen togas, and sprinklings of helmeted legionnaires and coarse-mantled, black-bearded tribesmen of the circumambient Vascones, all thronged the few paved streets and forum, moved by some vague and ill-defined uneasiness. I myself had just alighted from a litter, which the Illyrian bearers seemed to have brought in some haste from Caliguris across the Iberus to the southward. It appeared that I was a provincial quaestor named L. Cilius Rufus, and that I had been summoned by the proconsul. P. Scribonius Libo, who had come from Taraco some days before. The soldiers were the fifth cohort of the twelfth legion, under the military tribune Sex, Arcelius and the legatus of the whole region. Centurion, Balbutius, had also come from Caliguris, where the permanent station was. The cause of the conference was a horror that brooded on the hills. All the townsfolk were frightened, and had begged the presence of a cohort from Caliguris. It was the terrible season of the autumn, and the wild people in the mountains were preparing for the frightful ceremonies which only rumour told of in the towns. They were the very old folk who dwelt higher up in the hills and spoke a choppy language which the Vascones could not understand. One seldom saw them, but a few times a year they sent down little yellow, squint-eyed messengers who looked like Scythians to trade with the merchants by means of gestures, and every spring and autumn they held the infamous rites on the peaks, their howlings and altar fires throwing terror into the villages. Always the same, the night before the Cullens of Maios and the night before the Cullens of November. 
townsfolk would disappear just before these nights, and would never be heard of again. And there were whispers that the native shepherds and farmers were not ill-disposed toward the very old folk, that more than one thatched hut was vacant before midnight on the two hideous Sabbaths. This year the horror was very great, for the people knew that the wrath of the very old folk was upon Pompello. Three months previously, five of the little squint-eyed traders had come down from the hills, and in a market brawl three of them had been killed. The remaining two had gone back wordlessly to their mountains, and this autumn not a single villager had disappeared. There was menace in this immunity. It was not like the very old folk to spare their victims at the Sabbath. It was too good to be normal, and the villagers were afraid. For many nights there had been a hollow drumming on the hills, and at last the Aedile Tiberius, Aeneas Stilpo, half-native in blood, had sent to Balbutius at Caligoris for a cohort to stamp out the Sabbath on the terrible night. Balbutius had carelessly refused, on the ground that the villagers' fears were empty, and that the loathsome rites of hill folk were of no concern to the Roman people unless our own citizens were menaced. I, however, who seemed to be a close friend of Balbutius, had disagreed with him, averring that I had studied deeply in the black forbidden law, and that I believed the very old folk capable of visiting almost any nameless doom upon the town, which after all was a Roman settlement, and contained a great number of our citizens. The complaining Adil's own mother Helvia was a pure Roman, the daughter of M. Helvius Kinna who had come over with Scipio's army. Accordingly, I had sent a slave, a nimble little Greek called Antipata, to the proconsul with letters, and Scribonius had heeded my plea, and ordered Balbutius to send his fifth cohort, under Acelius, to Pompello, entering the hills at dusk on the eve of November's calends, and stamping out whatever nameless orgies he might find, bringing such prisoners as he might take to Taraco for the next proprietor's court. Balbutius, however, had protested, so that more correspondent had ensued. I had written so much to the proconsul that he had become gravely interested, and had resolved to make a personal inquiry into the horror. He had at length proceeded to Pompello with his lictors and attendants, there hearing enough rumours to be greatly impressed and disturbed, and standing firmly by his order for the Sabbath's extirpation. Desirous of conferring with one who had studied the subject, he ordered me to accompany Acelius's cohort, and Balbutius had also come along to press his adverse advice for he honestly believed that drastic military action would stir up a dangerous sentiment of unrest amongst the Vascones, both tribal and settled. So here we all were, in the mystic sunset of the autumn hills, old Scribonius Libo in his toga pretexta, the golden light glancing on his shiny bald head and wrinkled hawk face, Balbutius with his gleaming helmet and breastplate, blue-shaven lips compressed in conscientiously dogged opposition, young Acelius with his polished greaves and superior sneer, and the curious throng of townsfolk, legionaries, tribesmen, peasants, lictors, slaves, and attendants. I myself seemed to wear a common toga, and I have no especially distinguishing characteristic and everywhere horror brooded. The town and country folk scarcely dared speak aloud, and the men of Libo's entourage, who had been there nearly a week, 
seemed to have caught something of the nameless dread. Old Scribonius himself looked very grave, and the sharp voices of us later comers seemed to hold something of curious inappropriateness, as in a place of death or the temple of some mysterious god. We entered the praetorium and held grave converse. Balbutius pressed his objections, and was sustained by Asellius, who appeared to hold all the natives in extreme contempt, while at the same time deeming it inadvisable to excite them. Both soldiers maintained that we could better afford to antagonize the minority of colonists and civilized natives by inaction, than to antagonize a probable majority of tribesmen and cottagers by stamping out the dread rites. I, on the other hand, renewed my demand for action, and offered to accompany the cohort on any expedition it might undertake. I pointed out that the barbarous Vascones were at best turbulent and uncertain, so that skirmishes with them were inevitable sooner or later, whichever course we might take that they had not in the past proved dangerous adversaries to our legions, and that it would ill become the representatives of the Roman people to suffer barbarians to interfere with a course which the justice and prestige of the Republic demanded. That, on the other hand, the successful administration of a province depended primarily upon the safety and good will of the civilized element in whose hands the local machinery of commerce and prosperity reposed, and in whose veins a large mixture of our own Italian blood coursed. These, though in numbers they might form a minority, were the stable element whose constancy might be relied on, and whose cooperation would most firmly bind the province to the Imperium of the Senate and the Roman people. It was at once a duty and an advantage to afford them the protection due to Roman citizens. Even, and here I shot a sarcastic look at Balbutius and Asellius, at the expense of a little trouble and activity, and of a slight interruption of the draft-playing and cock-fighting at the camp in Calagoris, that the danger to the town and inhabitants of Pompello was a real one. I could not, from my studies, doubt. I had read many scrolls out of Syria and Egyptus, and the cryptic towns of Etruria, and had talked at length with the bloodthirsty priest of Diana Arecina in his temple in the woods bordering Lacus Namorensis. There were shocking dooms that might be called out of the hills on the Sabbaths dooms which ought not to exist within the territories of the Roman people, and to permit orgies of the kind known to prevail at Sabbaths would be but little in consonance with the customs of those whose forefathers, a. Postumius being consul, had executed so many Roman citizens for the practice of the Bacchanalia, a matter kept ever in memory by the Senatus Consultum de Bacchanalibus graven upon bronze and set open to every eye, checked in time, before the progress of the rites might evoke anything with which the iron of a Roman pilum might not be able to deal. The Sabbath would not be too much for the powers of a single cohort. Only participants need be apprehended, and the sparing of a great number of mere spectators would considerably lessen the resentment which any of the sympathizing country folk might feel. In short, both principle and policy demand stern action, and I could not doubt but that Publius Scribonius, bearing in mind the dignity and obligations of the Roman people, would adhere to his plan of dispatching the cohort, me accompanying, despite such objections as Balbutius and Asellius, speaking indeed more like provincials than Romans, might see fit to offer and multiply. The slanting sun was now very low, and the whole hushed town seemed draped in an unreal and malign glamour. 
Then P. Scribonius the proconsul signified his approval of my words, and stationed me with the cohort in the provisional capacity of a Centurio Primipilus, Balbutius and Asellius assenting, the former with better grace than the latter. As twilight fell on the wild autumnal slopes, a measured, hideous beating of strange drums flooded down from afar in terrible rhythm. Some few of the legionari showed timidity, but sharp commands brought them back into line, and the whole cohort was soon drawn up on the open plain east of the circus. Libo himself, as well as Balbutius, insisted on accompanying the cohort, but great difficulty was suffered in getting a native guide to point out the paths up the mountain. Finally, a young man named Vercelius, the son of pure Roman parents, agreed to take us at least past the foothills. We began to march in the new dusk, with the thin silver sickle of a young moon trembling over the woods on our left. That which disquieted us most was the fact that the Sabbath was to be held at all. Reports of the coming cohort must have reached the hills and even the lack of a final decision could not make the rumour less alarming. Yet there were the sinister drums as of yore, as if the celebrants had some peculiar reason to be indifferent whether or not the forces of the Roman people marched against them. The sound grew louder as we entered a rising gap in the hills, steep wooded banks enclosing us narrowly on either side and displaying curiously fantastic tree trunks in the light of our bobbing torches. All were afoot save Libo, Balbutius, Arcelius, two or three of the centurions, and myself, and at length the way became so steep and narrow that those who had horses were forced to leave them, a squad of ten men being left to guard them, though robber bands were not likely to be abroad on such a night of terror. Once in a while it seemed as though we detected a skulking form in the woods nearby, and after a half-hour's climb the steepness and narrowness of the way made the advance of so great a body of men. Over three hundred, all told, exceedingly cumbrous and difficult. Then with utter and horrifying suddenness we heard a frightful sound from below. It was from the tethered horses. They had screamed, not neighed, but screamed, and there was no light down there, nor the sound of any human thing, to show why they had done so. At the same moment bonfires blazed out on all the peaks ahead, so that the terror seemed to lurk equally well before and behind us. Looking for the youth Vercelius, our guide, we found only a crumpled heap weltering in a pool of blood. In his hand was a short sword snatched from the belt of D. Vibolanus, a sub centurio, and on his face was such a look of terror that the stoutest veterans turned pale at the sight. He had killed himself when the horses screamed. He who had been born and lived all his life in that region, and knew what men whispered about the hills. All the torches now began to dim, and the cries of frightened legionaries mingled with the unceasing scream of the tethered horses. The air grew perceptibly colder, more suddenly so than is usual at November's brink and seemed stirred by terrible undulations which I could not help connecting with the beating of huge wings. The whole cohort now remained at a standstill, and as the torches faded I watched what I thought were fantastic shadows outlined in the sky by the spectral luminosity of the Via Lactea as it flowed through Perseus, Cassiopeia, Cepheus, and Cygnus. Then suddenly all the stars were blotted from the sky, even bright Deneb and Vega ahead, and the lone Altaya and Fomalhaut behind us. 
and as the torches died out altogether, there remained above the stricken and shrieking cohort only the noxious and horrible altar flames on the towering peaks, hellish and red, and now silhouetting the mad, leaping, and colossal forms of such nameless beasts as had never a Phrygian priest or companion grandam whispered in the wildest of furtive tales. And above the nighted screaming of men and horses that demonic drumming rose to louder pitch, whilst an ice-cold wind of shocking sentience and deliberateness swept down from those forbidden heights and coiled about each man separately, till all the cohort was struggling and screaming in the dark, as if acting out the fate of Laocoon and his sons. Only old Scribonius Libo seemed resigned. He uttered two words amidst the screaming, and they echo still in my ears. Malitio vetus, malitio vetus est, venit, candem venit. And then I waked. It was the most vivid dream in years, drawing upon wells of the subconscious long untouched and forgotten. Of the fate of that cohort no record exists, but the town at least was saved for encyclopedias tell of the survival of Pompello to this day, under the modern Spanish name of Pompelona. Yours for Gothic Supremacy, C. Julius Vervus Maximus. <laughs>